Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. We'll turn and greet two or three of your neighbors. Welcome them here tonight. We'll get started. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to do something tonight that I've always desired to do, and that is to teach 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, within context. Um, dang, I forgot a book. <laughs> it's a brown little bitty book. Um, but anyway, I want to teach it in context tonight because it's the, uh, these two chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, give us probably more information on how we should view the area of giving than any other chapter in the Bible. And when you look at it in context, you can just gain a whole lot of information from it. So tonight I'm going to be going back and forth from two uh, different um, uh, translations. I'll use the Mirror Bible tonight and mostly the, uh, the King James Bible. But I think you'll find it, thank you, Vern. I think you'll find it pretty fascinating so that you can see just what was going on here. So I want to establish the foundation so that you can understand what's happening here. Paul had committed to receiving or collecting an offering for, uh, the, poor, poor, for the poor that were located in Jerusalem. And one of the things he was wanting to do is wanted the, the church, wanted Corinth, the Corinthians, to uh, be responsible for collecting this offering. And they had given their word to do so, but just never came through. And, and so this was like a, a, a ministry that Paul had established, a commitment that he had made to the poor of, uh, to the poor of Jerusalem. And when uh, the Corinthians didn't come through, he decided to use the Church of Macedonia as an inspiration to try to motivate them to go ahead and follow through because it's just like uh, any global missions that we have when we make a commitment to partner with somebody and to meet that commitment. Here's Paul saying, I'm committed to the poor and I'm committed to taking this collection up for the poor. So in the next two chapters, that's what you're gonna see. Paul encouraging, not commanding, but encouraging uh, the Corinthians to follow through as he talks about the grace of God that was on the Macedonians. Does everybody understand that? So that was cool for me because for years I was just like, you know, everybody just jumped into 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and I really just didn't understand what was going on. But it's all about Paul's commitment to the poor of Jerusalem. So we begin here in verse 1, uh, chapter 8. He says, Moreover, brethren, we do you <coughs> to wit <coughs> of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now that word wit, <coughs> It, it's a very interesting phrase. Basically, what he's saying is, I want to make known, or I want to testify. And so, what he is saying here, moreover, brother, when we do you to make known, we want to, you know, Paul is now using the, the church of Macedonia <clears throat> as an inspiration to try to motivate everybody else to, to participate. And he says, I want this known now. I want this to be testified of of the grace of God that was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. So now he's talking about the fact that here's the grace of God that's on the church of Macedonia. And ladies and gentlemen, you, you have to understand when you have experienced the unmerited, uh, unearned favor of God, when, you, when that favor is working in your life and when you see that favor working in your life, you will give. You will give. I mean, it, it's... I don't see how you can't. If that favor is working in your life and you've experienced it, the next thing you're going to want to do is to give because of that grace of God and that unmerited, undeserved favor that's working in your life. And so that's what he was saying here. He says, I want to make known of this grace 
that was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And, and you're going to see as a result of this unmerited favor that they, they, they had to give. I mean, they were graced to give. They wanted to give. They were willing to give because they had experienced this unmerited, undeserved favor. And then in verse 2, he says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now, this is very interesting here because he says here that, you know, he uses this, this trial of, well, you got affliction, you have joy, and you got poverty. Affliction, joy, and poverty. Now, in my mind, those things just don't go together. Affliction, joy, and poverty. Now, here's one thing I do understand. I know that joy comes from what you know. So they obviously had to know something because the Bible says that they had an abundance of joy. Joy comes from what you know. So they obviously knew something in order to have that abundance of joy. They had an abundance of joy. They knew that through their liberality that somehow they would be able to get out of this affliction. That if they would become liberal, they would get out of this situation. If they were to become liberal, they would find themselves uh, kind of free from the situation that they're in at this time. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, 25, that the liberal soul will be made fat or in abundance. There's something about, you know, it, it's the fact the Greek word, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of this, but it was fascinating with me. The Greek word here, uh, when it uses that word liberality, it means not seeking riches for self, but only, only seeking what I can give to someone else. Just that one word right there. And I was, I was, I wasn't shocked, but I was like, you know, the liberality that came, they were, they were totally focused on what they can do for the poor, for this ministry of Paul, how they can give. They were totally focused on giving them the advantage. It was not about seeking any advantage for self, but he says that this abundance of joy that came because of what they knew, plus this deep, this deep po poverty, it abounded to them being motivated not to seek for self, but what they can do for others. Now, that's going to be the central idea of the entire two chapters. It's what I can do for others. What did they know? They knew that there was a promise in the Word of God that made it very clear that if you would do something for others, if you would make your mind up to be liberal and give to others, not even thinking about yourself, then you would set yourself up to, to receive from God. In fact, 1 John chapter 3, 17, flip over there for a moment. 1 John chapter 3 and, and verse 17. Please understand that we're not going to take anything out of 2 Corinthians that's not, just not here very clear. But he says, but whosoever has this world's good and seeth his brother that have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Well, switch that around. What is he saying? If the love of God dwelleth in you, he cannot shut up his bowels of compassion when he sees somebody that's in need. That when the love of God is in you, you can't shut up your bowels of compassion when you see uh, your, uh, someone that's in, in need. But at the same time, God promises that he that gives to the poor lendeth to God and God will repay. They knew something. The church of Macedonia knew something, and it filled them with great joy. And their focus was not on them. Their focus was on who they can help and meeting the needs of the poor and to fulfill this mission that Paul had for Jerusalem. Now, let's look at verse 3. He says, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. And so I, I like what he says here in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, mirror Bible. He says, I salute them for their deliberate giving of themselves beyond their means. They, they, they gave beyond their means. Let me tell you, they, they, they were so motivated by the grace of God working in their lives. That grace that was put on them motivated them 
to give deliberately beyond their means and their ability to give. And so uh, you also see in verse 3 that they were willing of themselves to give. So this was not grudging. This was not something that they didn't want to do. This was not something that, you know, it pained them to do. This is something that they were all in. Their liberality was big, man. The grace of God on them, uh, the favor of God working in their life. They knew that all of their afflictions were going to be dealt with because of this opportunity they had to give to the poor. Look at what he says in verse 4. He said, praying us, uh, and I like to say it like this, it was more, uh, and, this, and this, is, this is amazing. I mean, every pastor dreams of this, but when they use the word praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, it's more like they were begging them that they would receive the gift. Think of that. Think of when the last time you went to church and the church was begging to be able to give. These people were, were, were really stirred up about wanting to give. The, the Mirror Bible says, we had nothing to do with this. <laughs> they were the ones who insisted with utmost sincerity and urgency that we, that we mediate their tangible grace gift to their fellow saints. I mean, that's powerful, that you so know something, you so have an understanding of something, that you dare not allow that opportunity to pass. I remember one time, well, there were several times I've done it, but I remember one particular time in our church where I completely forgot to take, receive the offering, and I'm closing, and I think I had clothes, and I was noticing that the congregation wasn't moving. I'm like, why don't, why, why don't y'all go somewhere? Go. Church is over with. Bye. And they were like, we, we forgot to give. And I sat there in amazement, and, and they were just thinking, we forgot to give. And they were not moving. And, and, and I'm thinking, whoa. I, 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 I'm like, look at this. They're, they're here. They're, they're not moving until they get that opportunity. To do. You have to know something. You have to have made your mind up that I make my living by my giving to the certain point that this is an opportunity I cannot allow to pass by me. And that's what they were saying here. We had nothing to do with this. They were the ones who insisted with utmost sincerity and urgency. Think of that. <laughs> Think of that, an urgency to be able to participate and to give. And notice what he says, praying or begging us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Now, not just talking about the, 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 the money that was being collected for them, but even before the money, they said, we want you to receive the gift. And here it's translated the grace, the grace of God that was on them, the grace of God that enabled them, the grace of God that was responsible for this urgency, this, the, the grace of God that was responsible for them insisting uh, uh, to, uh, with sincerity to be able to give to, to, the, to the poor. Where did that come from? It was the, it was the gift of the grace. And, and that's the grace he's saying, I, I want you to receive this gift of grace. I want you to have this grace on you so that you'll never allow these opportunities to pass by you. And then he goes on and he says, and then take upon us the fellowship, underline that word fellowship, take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, that word ministering is talking about giving. So he's saying, take upon the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. Now, that word fellowship comes from a, a, an old Greek word, which means participation, or the word we're familiar with is partnership. And so what they were saying, it received the grace, and they were going to take on partnership, partnership in this giving to the poor. And so they wanted to become partners with Paul where giving to the poor is concerned. I, I, I was just fascinated with this. Uh, he says, and take upon us the partnership or the fellowship, the partnership or the fellowship of giving to the saints. So they were not, they were not only talking about, well, we want to do this one time and it's over with, but they're saying, Paul, we want to partner with you. We want to partner with you in the giving to the saints. We want to partner with you in this endeavor that you've taken on to give to the poor of Jerusalem, we're your partners. Think of that, man. They're saying not only are we excited about giving, but we're excited about partnering with you, praise the Lord. I'm excited. Let me calm down. Okay? And so we move on to verse 5. He says, and this they did. Now, now this, this is so important. So they became partners. They, they, they entered into a fellowship with giving to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, 
But now watch this now, because this is important where partnership is concerned. But they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You know, before you become a real partner with any ministry, you got to first of all, number one, you got to first of all understand the importance of giving your heart to God first and then your heart to that person that you're in partnership with. That's so very important because your, your motive is, is greater than your gift. And, and God weighs the hearts of people. And so, you know, you can give money but have the wrong motive and, and the results is going to be zero. Motive is even bigger than the gift. And so they, first of all, gave themselves, gave their hearts to the Lord and then to Paul. And that's so vital here because a lot of times Christian people don't understand, well, what is it I'm giving and I'm doing this as nothing's happening. Your, your motives are all wrong. God's looking at your heart. God's weighing your motive. What is it that moves you to give? What is your motor that is motivating you to give? And what you'll find out is that motive to give should always be love. That motive to give should always be your appreciation, your thanksgiving, and your love that you have for the Father. And so they became partners with, with Paul in this endeavor, and, and they gave themselves to the Lord. I, I, know, I know so many people, that don't, they don't examine their heart motives of doing things. You, you don't give out of fear. You don't, you don't give out of necessity. You're giving, you know, you'll see that in the next chapter. You're giving out of appreciation and you're giving out of love. So examine your heart and ask yourself, have I given my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, number one, and have I given my heart to, in this case, to Paul and the mission that he has? I mean, this, this mission, you should give your heart to it. And you can tell you're doing things out of your heart and not for any other motivation that's around. And then he says here, uh, in so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so would also finish in, in you the same grace also. Uh, in the mirror bar, he says, inspired by their enthusiasm, we prompted Titus to complete his initiative in this grace gift that you yourselves were keen to participate in. And so, obviously, Titus had been trying to motivate the Corinthians to give and, and, and because of what they were sharing about the church of Macedonia, he now begins to, to say to Titus once again, uh, why don't you get in it and finish what you started now? Continue to, to do what you're doing so that these Corinthians can be motivated, you know, to, to, to get this grace of giving that's on the church of Macedonia to get it on them. And then we go, we go on to, to verse 7. He says, therefore, you know, I love this. This is Bible study. It gives me a chance to go line by line by line. You know, sometimes when you're preaching, you, you just wish you had a chance to just cover that whole chapter in context so that nothing can be taken out of context. Because I'm hitting to, I'm, I'm going on my way to a radical point. And because we're in context, you'll see it for yourself as it comes to you. But right here in verse 7, he says, therefore, as you abound or as you increase in everything, you abound it uh, in faith, you abound it in utterance, you abound it in knowledge, you abound it in diligence, you abound it in love. Now, in other, in other words, this list, everything you just called out, came out of grace. Grace was there first, and it all came out of grace. Faith came out of grace. Utterance came out of grace. The, the gifts of utterance, the knowledge came out of grace. The love came out of grace. He says, see that you abound and increase in this grace of giving also. He says, now, you, you, you've increased in all these other areas. Increase in the grace of giving also. Now, I, the Mirror Bible says again, uh, now everything about you already shines with extravagant evidence of your faith, of your conversations, of your knowledge, of your enthusiasm. All bear witness to the affection that we have awakened in you. This is your opportunity now to equally excel in the grace of giving, in the grace of giving. I remember a time that's all people talked about. They were trying to excel in their faith, and then they were trying to excel in the gifts of the Spirit, in revelation knowledge they were trying to excel in. And he says, as you have excelled in all of these other things, excel in the grace of giving. Man, that's powerful. Excel in the grace of giving. Isn't it amazing how 
people overlook this entire chapter and the, these next two chapters are talking strictly about money. What do you do now when you see preachers who say, well, there's no, no, nothing in the Bible that says anything about giving, and here we are going over an entire chapter about giving. And he, not only that, he says, see to it that you excel and that you increase and that you abound in this grace of giving just like you increased and abounded in faith, in the gifts of the Spirit, in the utterance. See that you increase in this also. In verse 8, he says, I speak not by commandment. Now, this is important. Paul wanted them to know, first of all, I, I started this whole thing to encourage you and to motivate you where this is concerned. He says, I'm not trying to put a commandment in here. This is not a commandment. He says, I'm not, I'm not trying to command you to give. I'm trying to motivate you to give. I'm trying to inspire you to give. And he starts this thing off. He says, he says I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the, of the forwardness or the boldness. That word forwardness in there. I, I speak by the boldness of others and to prove the, sincere, the, the, the sincerity of your love. He says, it's not a commandment, but this is an opportunity to prove the love. This is an opportunity for us to show the world our oneness. This is an opportunity for us, instead of just talking love, we can now demonstrate that love. This is not a commandment. I'm, I'm, I, this is an opportunity. It's an occasion for you to be able to give, meet the needs of the poor, and prove the sincerity of your love. I tell you, uh, Matthew chapter 10, uh, look at that for a moment. Matthew 10 and 8 talks about our authority. I want to go back for a moment to abounding in this grace of giving. I want you to see how it relates here. He says, heal the sick, cleanse the, the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Now, I want you to look at this part. Freely you have received, freely give. They receive all that other stuff. Freely you receive faith. Freely you receive knowledge. Freely you forget you received all the things that we love. Freely you received all of that. He said, freely give. Wow. So how many things can you count that have been given to you freely? And what he is saying, can you freely give and take this grace of giving and freely give? I'm not commanding you. This is not under the law where there's a commandment to do it and then there's a curse when you don't do it. He said, no, this is all about the grace of God. This is an awesome illustration of what this grace is all about. A heavenly father who continues to give to us when we don't even deserve it or we didn't do anything to earn it. And you're going to see later on at the end of the scripture, it's going to finally say that all of this was an illustration to show you the grace of God. Amen. Then he goes on, verse 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Powerful scripture. I want to make sure you understand what he is saying here because most people, it, it, it's, it's doing two things. Whether you look at this figure, figuratively or if you look at this literally, uh, you're still going to get the same truth out of it. I want to read the mirror translations before I, before I dive into this. In verse 9, he says, you are acquainted with what grace, what the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ communicates. He exchanges his riches for our poverty. The depth of his poverty became the reference to our wealth. Everything he had is now ours. Now, listen to me carefully. Uh, you got a couple of things, a couple of ways you can look at this. The fact that, you know, Jesus came from a much greater place down to earth. And in a sense, that would be a demotion kind of like because of where he was, that he became poor in coming here to allow us to be able to go there and become rich in what he had. And most people are so afraid of the, the other side that they've been, been comfortable with just, you know, figuratively defining it like that. But, ladies and gentlemen, there was an exchange no matter how you look at it. Uh, if, if you'll take some time to do some study and translate some of these words, you will find out that it also moves Jesus to a place in some scriptures where he, 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 he gave up what he had, became poor physically, so that somebody he was ministering to could have something. Gave up what he had. So, 
here's the point I'm trying to make. That because of what Jesus has done, whether you are satisfied with a figurative interpretation or a literal interpretation, either way, he gave up poverty in every realm so that you can be rich in every realm. And that includes this physical, natural realm as well. People hesitate to say that. They don't want to say that. But I want to give you hope tonight that if you're on welfare, Jesus has made an exchange. And you don't have to stay there. He wants you to fare well based on the exchange that he made on the cross. He became poor so that through his poverty, you might become rich. And, and they hate, you know, you're giving those people false hope. Well, listen, if I'd never heard that, I'd have never pursued it. You know, in my, here's what I've understood. Christian people don't get what they desire. They only get what they believe. And you can desire all day long, but you don't get what you desire. You get what you believe. And when you don't believe something, then you have the, the only thing that can limit God is your unbelief in the promises that he's made. If God has made you promise, then you're, you're going to have the next thing you got to do is I got to believe that promise. And when you make your mind up to believe that promise, Christians get what they believe. Glory be to God. But they don't get what they desire. You can go home and desire all night long a certain thing, and you, will, you won't get what you desire because you can't get what you desire unless you believe what, what it is you desire. And so say it out loud. I don't get what I desire. I get what I believe. And I believe the promises of God. Amen. It's just something about, somebody says, well, how does that work? It's just something about getting that word, getting that promise on your mind and keeping it there. That, that's the most powerful thing we can do as Christian people. Find out what the promise is and get it on your mind and keep it there. So what's the battle? The battle is now trying to use different things to try to get the promise off your mind. You have to understand how this, this, this whole thing works. Satan's ultimate job is to try to attack your mind, to get your mind focused on something else, so you don't keep your mind focused on that which is about to come to pass in your life. Glory be to God. So discover the Scripture, get your mind on the Scripture, keep your mind on the Scripture, and watch and see some things begin to happen in your life. This Christian life is real simple, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't take all of the extravagant religious excerpts that we try to put forth to try to get something to come to pass. It just, it's just a matter of, I just found out that that's mine, I'm going to keep that on my mind, and I'm not going to let it go until I get it. Because <laughs> Christians don't get what they desire, they get what they believe. Amen? Amen? And so I believe that. I believe in any area of my life where there's a poverty or lack, that Jesus has made the exchange, and I have a right as the righteousness of God to believe that. I have a right as the righteousness of God to receive that, it has been presented to me through his grace. I take it, and I believe it, and let the world try to talk me out of it, but I'm not going to let it go. Poverty is not the will of God. It has never been the will of God. It will never be the will of God. In fact, the old covenant says that poverty is a curse. Please explain to me how if poverty is a curse, that it's the will of God, and he's the one that delivered you from the curse. Poverty is a curse. And the day you realize it's a curse, you won't tolerate it, praise God. And he died on that cross. And it also makes prosperity a part of the finished works of Jesus Christ. It also makes prosperity in the same category as your healing, as your deliverance, as your salvation. But if you don't believe it, then you won't see it. And that's what's happened to this world, is that they've been talked out of a piece of the pie that belongs to them. If you look at the pie, there's only one piece there, and that's that little prosperity piece because they don't think they're worthy or they don't want to be all the other things they talk about. You know, I'm just trying to change your mind. I'm just saying. You know, 34 years ago, I'd have, I'd have, I'd have, I'd have said something to you, you know, with your broke self. And if you want to be poor, fine, da da da. But not, none of that stuff works. I just, I'm going to just keep getting it, get, build your faith up, build your faith up, build your faith up. Get it on your mind, show you what the scriptures say in context, and who knows, you might have a dream and wake up, I believe. And the angels be like, God, dog, by time. Okay? Look at verse 10. He says, And therein I give my advice. Now notice again, not my commandment. Notice again, my advice. Notice again, my encouragement, not my commandment. 
You can't take this and turn it into a commandment and then start preaching it to people because you put them back under the law. Because the whole point is I've given my heart to God and I'm giving up because I love and I, I have an, I'm having an opportunity to show the sincerity of my love. That's the whole point of it. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be willing a whole year ago. And he's, again, he's trying to encourage the, the, uh, those guys in, at, at Corinth to be willing to go ahead and get involved in this. Come on and come through with it. Verse 11, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. So he says, let's add some action to it now. The Mirror Bible says, it can only be to your own advantage if you would now also complete your willingness by reaching into your resources and giving liberally according to your means. So he says, you know, you can sit and say amen all day long, but it, it's only going to be to your advantage if you would now also complete your willingness. So he's like, you can't go around and be just willing. It's not going to be to your advantage to want to. It's not going to be to your advantage to say, well, I would really like to. It's only going to be to your advantage. And I like what the mirror says here, and I'm going to say it like I want to say it. It says, it can only be to your own advantage if you would now also reach in your pocketbook and pull out some money. That's what he said, isn't it? In other words, the performance also has to come forth in order for you to begin to, to see what he's talking about here. Verse 12, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. The willingness of heart is matched by what someone is able to give. I mean, it is one thing to be willing to give a million dollars, but if you haven't got a million dollars, then at least give the 10 you do have. In other words, he's only, he's only saying, man, you know, you can only give what you have to give. Verse 13, for I mean not that other men be eased and that you be burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be su uh, a supply for their want and that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Equality in uh, sharing the, the stressed. Equality in sharing the load of what's going on in that ministry to the fore. Now, he goes on here. Let me read this in the Mirror Bible again, verse 12 and um, verse 13 and 14. He says, I'm not suggesting that others must be eased at your expense. The idea is that everyone should always have enough. Your abundance can now bring immediate relief to them and vice versa. It can bring immediate relief to you if you're in that situation. I think we have to begin to teach this because it's, it's, You'll see later on how Paul was really saying those who are the household of faith. And I don't think people should have to quit coming to church because they're having a hard time. I think as we learn how to put things away and put things aside, that we're always in a position to give what we have, it, 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 except we just don't put things aside. We're, we're so busy trying to believe God for wealth and riches, we don't even know how to manage our money. We don't know how to make a budget. We don't know how to choose the right car or choose the right house or you, to choose the right thing for you. Sometimes your taste gets a little bit expensive. And like I said before, your investment is a whole lot lower than your expectations. Your investments are low and your expectations are, are, are really, really high and they don't match the investment at all. There just comes a time where people are growing and they begin to move that you understand how to take those steps. You understand that you're not going to drive that particular car always, but for right now, on my way to this thing, I'm going to drive this. And you don't have to, you know, you can, you, you can find a, a, a neighborhood where you have safe housing that's affordable, that you can live in, and you might have to pay a little bit more gas. Uh, there's a lot of little things you can do, but you've got to be smart enough to start off with those things right there. You, you just can't ignore the practical that God has put in your life and try to bypass the practical by becoming so 
spiritual that you're no earthly good. And, and, and it, it does make sense to be able to keep up with what you're spending. It does make sense not to take your check and go cash it and walk around with a pocket full of cash. Because you, you're talking about a quick way to spend money is when you have it in cash. Can I get a witness? Look, looking like a drug dealer walking around with all that money in your cash. It's just, it's just little things like that. It's, it's little things like that. I mean, you doing what you're doing with three cell phones, you know? Get one cell phone and a cheap one at that because you know where you are. Don't go around and take a scripture and say, well, my God said that I'm, I'm rich in houses and land. Boy, you ain't even got an apartment yet. Get, be rich in an apartment first, okay? Be rich in an apartment. Stack your money. Get your stuff ready to go. Plan. You know, you got to have, the, you gotta have some, 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 some plans, you know, a short-term plan, short-term goals, and then long-term goals. I see y'all looking at me. I ain't come here all that. But, but see, a lot of your problem ain't the devil. It's just bad decision-making. It's just bad planning and bad, bad decision making and not thinking about, you know, doing stuff. And, and sometimes there's some people who spend money that they don't even have yet. Right. Somebody promised you a contract and they were going to do that. And you just go all out and you just, you just got to back up. It's, it, I, I guarantee you, there's, you know what I'm talking about. You regret when you blew through $100,000 and, and that could have that been your house right there. That could have been your car right there. Oh, I got a witness over here on the right side. Amen. Amen. And like I said before, when you're told to listen to your elders, it's not because they're perfect. It's because they have a whole lot of experience <laughs> at making mistakes. <laughs> Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. So it, it's those kind of things, understanding how to balance your checkbook, understanding that you don't have to be at, at one bank, at, that they don't give you free checking. Somebody would love to have your business and give, give you free checking. Knowing that when you order checks uh, or when you go by the, the machine that there's going to be a fee and you got to take it out of your bank book so you can keep up with a, a, a perfect balance of what's going on because you need to always know where you're located at all times, know where you're located. But imagine if you could reduce your life down to living by 80% of what you have and you've got 20% left over to give and to spend to pay yourself. You have something that you can plan on doing. But sometimes we want it. This is the kind of generation and society we're living in. We want it, and I mean we want it rat, R-A-T, now. We want it rat now. Oh, I got a deal on this gigantic house. But do you understand the maintenance on that gigantic house? Yeah, they got it for you cheap, but that house is going to have to be maintenance. And if they got it, if you bought it for cheap, that's probably a whole lot wrong. Probably a whole lot going on with that house that you ain't going to know until it rain. <laughs> these, these are the common sense type of things that I believe if you accomplish those things first, then I think you'll begin to see even more and experience more the supernatural that God, God has. I mean, I remember when Taff and I first got married, we were living in, off Riverdale Road, and I think they called River Glen Apartments. And, you know, we, we, I, I, I rented furniture, Aaron's rent. I rented furniture. I bought Wolfman Jack uh, dinette set with the little chairs that made out of iron. When you sit at them after a while, they start getting lower and lower and lower. We had wicker furniture, wicker backboard, the little, the little wicker hearts with the little stem at the top of it. And you put them all over the room and little plastic, little tables for end tables and you got to do what you got to do. But we know we were just visiting there. Oh, uh, come on, somebody. See, you got to understand when you're just a visitor. And right, right where some of y'all are, you're just visiting. You're just visiting. That is not your abode. You are visiting there on your way to destiny. You know, destiny has a very interesting way of releasing servants that will help usher you to the place where you're supposed to be. And sometimes those servants are hard times, and sometimes those servants is falling on your face, and sometimes those servants is making bad decisions. But, you know, if you'll put it all together and just take heed, take heed, turn to your neighbor and say, take heed. take heed. Take heed to the things that have happened in your life and become smarter with what you have and listen to people who've been here longer than you. 
I got to say that one more time. Listen to people that have been here longer than you because they most likely have seen stuff happen two or three times. I mean, like, what's going on? I remember, y'all remember the Watergate? This, I remember Nick's and, and, and how this person got in trouble, that person got in trouble, that person got in trouble, that person got in trouble, and then they found some tapes. Listen. Listen. Amen? All right. Help me. What verse? Let's see, verse 15, right? Okay, so the equality was that we want to, you know, we want to all come together and be equal in what we do to help other people so that we can all be blessed. He says, that is, as it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. That's how it ought to be, especially in our church, especially in our church, especially in our church. You know, I'm not the kind of pastor that wants to spend a lot of time going overseas looking for the poor. I got some right here in College Park. You understand what I'm saying? Not that we won't do that, but it, it, you have to pay attention to what's right in your church, what's right in down the street, what's right around the corner, those kind of things. And we have to be a church without walls to be able to see that. Verse 16, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into, into the hearts of Titus for you. So Titus got this, this same heart of wanting to, to, to bless the poor. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you, and we have sent with him the brethren. So now Macedonia is saying, look, we're, we're going to send somebody with you because, you know, we want to make sure that everything is happening just like you say it's going to happen. Say accountability. accountability. And, and we sent him the brethren whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind, uh, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. And so they were concerned about accountability, and that's important, the fact that, you know, we don't want to be, you know, not accountable to somebody. And that, that's so, pe people are going to talk, but you, you got to make sure you have accountability with the money, with the finances. You know, there is no law that says a church has to have an audit. In fact, an audit could be very expensive. Our audits, oh, you know, every year are, what, $100,000 or more? Depends on what kind of year it was. But there's no law to do it, and there are lots of churches who don't do it. But this is not one of them. With a last name like Dollar, I can't afford not to have an audit which means, you know, even on our board of directors, we have uh, uh, compensation committees, we have uh, ethics committee, committee, and there's one more, I can't think of it either, compensation, ethics. See, we have an ethics committee that goes around and check with people to find out if they know or have seen anything under the hand that has been taking place. That's important to me. It's important for, for me to have an audit done so that that audit can be seen not by the public, not by the news media, but by members who have given their heart to God and to this church who would like to know, well, did that happen? Yeah, it did happen. And we paid money to make sure that everything is in the role and everything is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So you ask me, why can I be so bold? It's because number one, I know I'm Taffy and I are above board but number two, that we take the time to make sure that this ministry is operating above board by having an audit done on it and making sure that people, I've never even seen like money that's taken up. I don't, I don't, I don't even, I don't even, I don't know where it is. I don't know, I don't know exactly where it goes. I prefer for somebody else to know that and be accountable. I know when it's missing though. <laughs> I know about the Holy Ghost when it's missing. You ain't got to show me nothing. I know about it. I can wake up in the middle of the night and say something wrong. <laughs> something ain't right. And we did that one time with one of our churches. And, and I knew, I mean, I'm not even there every weekend, but I knew at that particular church something was not right. And it turned out it wasn't. And it was corrected immediately. But uh, I tell you what, man, it's, it's above board. You can't, you can't count the money on a coffee table and then throw it in your trunk 
And, 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 and that ain't, that's not accountability. And that's what Paul was saying. They chose a person to go with them so that they could come back and bring the report of the money and that it was being used for what it was being used to accomplish. I still think that's important. I think it's something that has to be done. We will continue to get an audit until Jesus come because if that audit report is not right, then, you know, somebody's got to give an account of what wasn't right. And that's why we have it because it's too precious for things that are going on in this world. I like when people call, this one lady called one time, she says, I want my money back. I said, ma'am, I'd love to give it back to you, but it's gone. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, some people think it's just like a bank that we get money and, and, and it's in a bank somewhere. It's gone. It ain't even nothing to rob. It ain't even here no more. As soon as it come in, it's gone. What do you mean it's gone? It's just Monday. It left early Monday morning. <laughs> early Monday morning. Amen. Then he goes on here and he says, uh, verse 21, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That was important to Paul. Not honesty and integrity in his, just in the eyes of God, but also in the eyes of men. That's a vital, vital piece. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do in inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you or our brethren. Uh, be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. And he, find, he, he ends this in verse 24. Wherefore, show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. There it is again talking about the proof of your love. The, um, uh, this Bible here, uh, what is it? The Mirror Bible says, give these churches proof of your love and confirm the good reason we have to be proud of you. That it was sent on a mission to take this offering where it needed to be. Now, it goes into... 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where it begins now to spell out some pretty vital principles and motives behind your giving. You see what was going on in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The whole chapter was about money. The whole chapter was about the giving of money to those who were in need. It was about that mission that Paul had for the poor in Jerusalem to collect offerings and for people to give and that if you are in poverty, know something about your liberality, that it's going to produce great joy because of what you know about being liberal. Well, he picks up here in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 9, for as touching the ministering to the saints. Now, what did he just say? So as dealing with this issue of giving to the saints. So he's getting ready to, to deal with that. He says, our commitment to administer this relief fund to assist our fellow saints is obvious. It shouldn't even be necessary for me to write to you about this. But then in verse 2, he says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you, boast, boast you to them of the Macedonians, that at Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal uh, hath provoked very many. He's just continuing what he was doing. And verse 3, And yet have I sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. The mirror says, so now I am sending these brothers in response to your readiness to confirm our boasting about you. Verse 4, lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say, uh, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Not you, but we. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. Now, the mirror says, this is the reason why I am rec rec recruited that I've recruited this team, to go in advance and to give you the necessary time to arrange for the blessing that you have promised. 
I want it to remain the blessing that you originally attended and not something that you now feel pressured to give. Again, no pressure to give. This is encouragement. Now he begins to talk about something here, and I want you to watch this very, very carefully. We started out with the grace of God, and we saw how grace enabled their giving. I'm saying this tonight because I've heard some say that your giving is what enables your grace. In other words, if I give, then grace will be made available. I thought that at some time myself, but it is the grace of God that makes, uh, that in, in equips you to be able to give. Look at verse 5, verse 6. He says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also what? Sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also what? Bountifully. So Paul is saying, you know, uh, you know, this is a serious law. We are all familiar with the natural law that says stingy sowing will always reflect in, 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 uh, in, in the same kind of harvest, and so does liberal sowing. It just re reflects in the same kind of harvest. Now, Here's the thing I want you to see here. You know, after all of this that's going on, he begins now to talk about some spiritual principles and laws that go with uh, this, this, this liberal giving. Again, motivating and, and, and inspiring. And he says to them, and this is awesome, he says if you, if you give sparingly, then that's just the harvest you got. If you give bountifully, that's the harvest you got. And like I said Sunday, it's an awesome thing that God has given you the authority in giving to be able to determine your own measure of return. So you don't have a job to make your living, you make your living through your giving. You know, it's time for you to understand that your job does not, is not responsible for your living and will never be, be enough for you to accomplish the thing that God called you to accomplish. It's always gonna cause you to be able to understand the power that comes in giving. All right, now look at verse seven. He says, every man according as he's purposed in his heart, so let him give Again, not grudgingly. When you give grudgingly, that means you don't want to. Uh, notice in, in chapter 8, it was all about will, will for heart, wanting to do it, uh, motivated to do it, uh, inspired to do it, you know. Uh, that was grace. Grace gave them that. Uh, that. All that we saw about Macedonia, grace gave it to them, man. They were thrilled to do it. Uh, they were begging to be a partner with this. Think of that, man. Begging that you receive their offering. And so he says, uh, every man according as he's purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I think I've explained to you what it means to give out of necessity. In the old covenant, it mentioned tithe. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse that you may have meat in my house. Prove me and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. Then he says, you're cursed with a curse if you don't do it. All right, so now they had to give out of, out of necessity of not being cursed. That if they, not, if they didn't give their tithes and offerings out of, out of necessity, they would, they would not be able to escape the curse. But what's even the other part of it is to give to be blessed. Here's the thing you understand. You're blessed because of Jesus. Your giving now releases your trust, which is the currency, to receive what Jesus has already done. All right, now see the difference here. We should never be giving out of pressure and out of fear. Oh, if I don't give, then I'm going to be cursed. Now, you may notice your supplies and your resources are low <laughs> if you don't give, but you won't, be, you won't be cursed. It's just it happened because you didn't give. <laughs> It happened because your giving is an expression of your trust, and you, 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 you just continue to demonstrate that you don't trust God because you don't think it matters, and yet you trust that money more than you trust God. And so if you find yourself giving because you feel it's necessary for me to give so I won't be cursed, or you feel it's necessary for me to give so I will be blessed, that's exactly what he said. He, that is exactly what he's talking about. Don't give like that anymore. He says, I want you to give because you are grateful and thankful and appreciative of what this God of grace has brought into your life. Because when that grace is on you, you will be generous. It's just, you don't even have to get a calculator, dude. When the grace of God is working on your life, 
and you have experienced this unmerited favor, you will be generous. I can't explain to you the intricate details that are involved, but there is just something or someone on the inside of you, you will be generous. You don't, you don't have to, 10% of this is this. You don't even do that. You're going to look back and you're going to realize that you have been given over 10% because of this unmerited favor that's wa- working and operating in your life. So he says, if you can give with a cheerful heart of gratitude, and when you can give out of a cheerful heart of thanksgiving, uh, then it's going to be an amazing thing happening in your life. Now, some of you may be saying, well, uh, Pastor Dollar, are you saying that we shouldn't tithe anymore? Are you against tithing? Well, you know the illustration that I use that when my father was alive and he told us, if you cross the street without looking, I'm going to whoop you. And so out of fear of punishment, we look both ways. But he is now dead, uh, and he's, I, I no longer live under the threat of the punishment of my father whooping me if I don't look both ways when I cross the street. But how many of you know that on a busy place, it is still to my best interest to look both ways? Even though I'm, I, 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 even though I'm not under the punishment, it's still to my best interest to look both ways. And so likewise, it is still to my best interest to tithe, even though we're no longer under the threat of punishment for not tithing. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, now, here's the, here's the part I want you to get. So, you see, give grudgingly. Don't give grudgingly. Don't give out of necessity. Give out of a cheerful heart. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, that looks like that you're giving with a cheerful heart gave birth to uh, God able to make all grace abound on, towards you. No. Please understand something. Everything you can do is because of his grace. It is not giving first that produces grace. It is grace that's producing your ability to give cheerfully. You're giving cheerfully because God's grace is on you to be able to give cheerfully. The, 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 the thing I don't want you to say is I'm going to sow a seed and the grace of God is going to come over my life. Well, that would not be unmerited favor then, isn't it? Because it was the sowing of seed that now you deserve grace because you gave cheerfully. You deserve grace because you gave out of gratitude. No, no. You have to literally read this backwards in order to see what he's talking about. This grace... He makes all grace increase towards you, just like he did Macedonia. All grace has increased increased towards you. And now that that grace has increased towards you, you can give liberally. And you'll always have all sufficiency in all things, and you'll increase to every good work because of the grace that's on you to be able to give cheerfully. In fact, let's go on verse 9. The grace that's on you to give cheerfully. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. This guy that's got the grace on him. Now, he that ministers seed to the sower, that's God, ministering seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Next verse. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. Let me, I want to read something out of the mirror translation real quick. Y'all with me? This Bible study, right? This is where you come cut your teeth and somebody comes saying something crazy and you say, that ain't what that mean. Uh, Verse 10, he says, the inventor of seed and bread is also the one who supplies and multiplies your resources and increases the harvest of your righteousness. Uh, Verse 11, you are mutually enriched in every possible sense of the word and inseparably joined to one another in an undivided heart without any hidden agenda. And together, we, the conduit of your gifts, will set the stage for a joyous grace celebration to God. Verse 12, this is such a win-win situation. Not only are the saints endorsed in their I amness through this most practical translation of your gener- generosity, but it also causes an abundant overflow of great gratitude to God as the testimony of his goodness finds tangible expression in your gifts. And so people begin to rejoice because your, your, the blessing is coming on them. And so the ripple effect continues. The gospel you communicate 
has found a very articulate voice in your giving. Loud at mercy, did you hear that? <laughs> Let me read that to you again. The gospel you communicate has found a very articulate voice in your giving. My giving articulates grace. You remember what I said? Expression. My giving articulates grace. But not only that, he said it produces a rich harvest of glory to God. My giving produces a rich harvest of glory to God. Your union with them further communicates the all-inclusive nature of the kononia we all participate in, the glory. Verse 14, oh, excuse me, the kononia is the fellowship, the partnership, excuse me. Kononia is fellowship or partnership, not glory. Kononia is fellowship or partnership, not glory. I think I said it enough for the tape. <laughs> he said that, did that. I corrected it three times, didn't I? Verse 14, can you imagine how your abundant generosity to them has tied them to you with deep affection in their prayers for you? Whew. Here's what I've been waiting to get to. Gratitude is the language of grace. Gratitude is the language of grace. Your giving has given a voice to his gift beyond words. Your giving has given a voice to his gift, referring to his grace, beyond words. My giving has given a voice to the gift of grace. A voice to the gift of grace. It's one thing for somebody to know grace, but a voice, the voice of grace, my giving gives voice to that grace. When I'm giving to someone who's going through problems and they're going through situations and they're going through rough times, they're not just hearing a lesson on grace, they're hearing the voice of grace through my giving. Wow. Gratitude is the language of grace. Being grateful and being thankful and I want to speak that language of grace. I want to be grateful and I want to be thankful for what God has done and is doing in my life. In Jesus' name. Did you get anything out of those two chapters? That's, those two chapters, man. Those two chapters right there, I mean, they give you so much understanding in comparison, in comparing the grace of God with giving that giving, it's not just about money, I keep trying to tell you. It's so bigger than that. And all the enemy wants to do is to try to plug your giving up and somehow try to make it not important or to be very passive about it. But it's, it's gigantic. It, it's the voice of grace. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands up and give God thanks for anything you got out of that. Father, we thank you for that right now tonight. We, we so, we appreciate that. And we just give you praise, Lord, that we're not just participating in some, you know, passive function of the local church. Our giving gives voice to grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that, that as we hunger and thirst for you, you're filling us up that we, we don't have to walk around in deception. We don't have to be deceived. Our life doesn't have to be paralyzed and things not working like your word says they should be working. And because of what we now know and understand about this grace of giving, Lord, let us lay hold of it with our whole heart. Let us know that it's more than just giving of money but we are now demonstrating and giving a voice to this unmerited, undeserved favor. Make us sensitive to the ministry to the poor. 
and, and let us lay aside so that we'll always be prepared to help and to remove burdens and destroy lives in, in the lives of people. We bless you and praise you for this now, Lord. We love you. We love you. Where would we be without you? What ditch would we be in tonight without you? Maybe dead without you. But because of your unmerited favor, we can look in the mirror and declare that we've been made righteous. We believe, God, and we will get what we believe, right or wrong, good or bad. We get what we believe. But thank you, Lord, for not letting us be deceived. <laughs> Deception is over. And let us walk in an abundance of joy, even in the midst of affliction, because of what we know. And we praise you for it now. In Jesus' name. Come on, Lord. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love that. I love that. Give me a bunch of folks who will sit around and just go through and work with you line by line by line. Boy, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's Bible study right there. You hear me? That's Bible study right there. Somebody said, well, what's Sunday? I don't know, but this is Bible study right here. <laughs> Lord, uh, what would you have us to sow tonight? We prepare to do this, and we give you praise for the opportunity to do it. You said you'll minister seed to the sower. We are sowers in this house. And we'll always have seed because you minister seed to sores. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have